Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 on Channels Television live from Lagos. A quick reminder of our top stories now. President Mohamed Buhari sent special envoy to South African President Cyril Ramaphosa to convey his concerns on violent attacks against Nigerians in South Africa. President Ramaphosa condemns attacks on foreigners in South Africa, says that violence is unjustified. Traffic gradually builds up as ongoing reconstruction at the Berger Kara axis of the Lagos Ibadan Expressway begins to take shape. And residents flee to the roofs to escape rising flood waters as Hurricane Dorian continues to hover above the Bahamas. For more information on our top stories, please visit our website is channelstv.com. YouTube.com forward slash channelsweb has videos of our shows. The ongoing reconstruction work at the Berger Kara axis of the Lagos Ibadan Expressway entered day two with traffic gradually building at the work and the work proper taking shape. Although commuters seem worried about the situation, security and traffic officials have continued to give them words of assurance that compliance with rules guiding the use of roads, particularly by commercial bus drivers, will prove to be making the work easier. Our correspondent Olu Phillips, who has been monitoring the situation, now reports. It's up and running and very officially so. The much talked about restricted movement along the Begakara corridor of the Legacy Bada Expressway is underway. This is the major point where vehicles traveling inbound Lagos will have to be excused to join a narrowed two lane of the Lagos outbound traffic, making its two lane a piece. Three observations come to bear at this confluence point. First, there seem to be a high human traffic, that is, those crossing the highway. Secondly, there is an existing bus stop at the very point where traffic is being diverted. And three, traffic is further delayed in addition to the slow movement. Over one and a half hours. Just from that um, long bridge to this place. Well, other than one wouldn't have expected it would be so hectic as this. So, well, what can we do? Also, vehicles have started breaking down, thereby compounding inconveniences experienced. When people are not obeying traffic rules, as you ought to do in a construction zone, as it is now, all is doing well. Before the commencement of the partial closure, this ASIS has been notorious for security issues. It's already looking like there will be a constant slow movement around this vicinity. Wouldn't it be precautionary to have government, whether at the state or federal level, illuminate this axis to avoid the ills that happen in the cover of the dark? For an effective project management system, what I have seen today should be uh, an indices for all the contractors and every stakeholder on this project to have a daily review of activity. So I expect a situation where, for instance, the security ag agency, um, government officials will do a daily debriefing of what they have seen today that will help them re-strategize for the next day because it seems like every day is going to be peculiar. Olu Phillips, Channels Television News. As promised, we're now being joined from our Abuja studios by the Permanent Secretary, former Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. That will be uh, Ambassador uh, Joe Keshi. He joins us now. I want to thank you so much indeed for joining us on this very important day to discuss these uh, up upheavals that we've seen both in South Africa and in Nigeria. We all know this. Nigeria and South Africa, their relationship has come a long way. Are you surprised at the turn of events where Nigerians are being attacked repeatedly? It's not the first time it has happened in South Africa. Actually, I'm not uh, surprised, but first, thanks for having me on your uh, program this evening. 
Uh, I'm not surprised because this is not the first time uh, this is happening, nor is it the second time this is happening. But we must also recognize the fact that there are so many reasons why this is uh, happening and um, uh, our response needs to be rational and not uh, emotional. But let me say very quickly that um, you could actually attribute this to the fact that many South Africans are yet to enjoy the, the full benefit of the end of apartheid. And so as a result of the limited opportunities, you know, in, in the country, they see foreigners, particularly those on the streets, the traders, those in the retail end, you know, and they see them as those taking their jobs, which is not uh, correct, which is not true. You also have to remember what uh, Frank Fanon once said in his book, The Wretched of the Earth, that where the oppressed cannot get at the oppressor, they go after the community of the oppressed. And that's exactly what we are witnessing in, uh, in uh, South Africa, because this is happening repeatedly against foreigners, against Africans in uh, South Africa. But perhaps the last point I will make in response to your question is also the fact that we also need to take into consideration the behavior of our own nationals. And I'll just give you an example. In this country, in Nigeria, there are two communities that are making a lot of money. They're actually making money because they play in all the sectors of the Nigerian economy. But most Nigerians don't even know because they are not loud. They don't ride in, pro, uh, in uh, Pragdo. They don't buy Mercedes Benz. They don't go in business class. But these guys are making a lot of money, but they live quietly. So if we also can Ambassador, begin that, to that adopt that kind of attitude. My apologies. That doesn't necessarily you know, uh, paint everyone with one brush. But let me ask you this question as well. Do you believe that these attacks, though denied by the South African authorities, do you believe that they are xenophobic in nature? Well, to some extent, yes. But again, I was just explaining to you that you've got to understand why this is happening. It, there are a number of factors, and you've got to take that into, into consideration, which is why I said, look, just like the students who reported, have called for caution, we need to exercise some restraint as well in responding to, to this because it's not only happening to Nigerians, it's actually happening to a lot of Africans living in South Africa and working in some areas in South Africa. You need to understand that, that there are a lot of foreigners, Africans working in corporate South Africa that are not being attacked. There are Nigerians and uh, non-Nigerians, Africans again in the university system that are not being attacked. So when you begin to take that into consideration, you begin to have a picture of what's happening and why it's happening in, in South Africa. I must thank you so much indeed, a former permanent secretary to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ambassador Joe Keshi. Many thanks indeed for talking to us on the News at 10. As part of efforts to stem the tide of insecurity in Zamfara State, Governor Bello Muhammad is reaffirming his administration's commitment to ensure peace and security in all parts of the state. Governor Muhammad, who was speaking in Gaso, the state capital, explained that the government is more determined to sustain the, the prevailing peace in the state through dialogue and reconciliation. He appeals to residents of the state to team up with the government in order to reduce the menace of banditry and cattle rustling to the barest. Zamfara State has been revived by horrible and unimaginable crimes such as kidnapping, cattle rustling, and banditry. This has crippled our rural economy and scared away potential investors and the person of goodwill who might have something to contribute to the development of the state. But today, Alhamdulillah, our effort of achieving peace has come to reality, to do sincere dialogue. As I keep on illustrating, we are determined to address all issues related to insecurity and resolve them amicably. You're watching the news at 10 on channels television, reaching you live from Lagos. Let's cross over to our Abuja studios now, where Markwe Ogun Yusuf is standing by to take us through a couple of more stories. Markwe. Hello, Gimba. It's good to see you. 
Now, following the statement issued by the federal government that Leah Sharibo is still alive, the family of the abducted Dapche schoolgirl have come out to appeal to the federal government to secure the release of their daughter. The family made the appeal during a media briefing in Yola, the Adamawa state capital. The briefing was attended by Leah Sharibo's father, Nathan Sharibo, foster mother, Rebecca Sharibo, and biological mother, Rahila Nathan Sharibo. <laughs> It is difficult to mention the name Leah Sharibu without drawing out emotions. Out of over 100 girls abducted by Boko Haram from their school in Dapchi, Yobe State in February 2018, Leah is the only student yet to be released, a situation that has left her family distraught. Protest marches and prayer sessions have been held in solidarity with the 16-year-old. There was a time when word emerged of her death, information that spread infuriation. But the federal government quickly dispelled the rumor, blaming the story on detractors. It's absolute fake news. Lately, cheerful news has come out from the government that Leah is alive and well, and negotiations are still on to secure release. This has once again brought hope to the Sharibu household, who have stayed strong in their most trying time. Her father speaks of the prospect of seeing Leah again. The special uh, assistance to the presidency come out and declare that our daughter is still alive. So we really appreciate for that information. And now we come here to uh, plead for the federal government and cry for them that they should do something possible for the release of our daughter. Also here are her mothers. Yes, biological and foster. Both women expressed their eagerness to see their daughter again. I have come to cry to the government. Please, since this thing happened, they said they will secure the release of this girl. Until today, she has not been released. We are very disturbed and worried. Since this girl was abducted, we have known no peace. <laughs> Last time when the general elections was getting closer, we were told that Leah is dead, but they came out to say Leah is alive until when Grace came out to say Leah is dead. Please, they shall try and help us bring back my daughter. Help me and bring back my Leah. <laughs> Why she remains captive is somewhat a mystery. The only person from whom everyone wants to hear the reason is Leah Sherubu herself. And hopefully, that will be sooner than later. Well, indeed, we do hope that Leah Sherubu returns safely to her family. Now, the federal government wants to embrace informal miners across the country in a bid to reduce the activities of illegal miners. At a meeting with the Miners Association of Nigeria in Abuja, the Minister of Mines and Steel Development, Mr. Alami Lekon Adigbite, affirms that this will assist in diversifying Nigeria's economy from oil and gas dependency. Mr. Adigbite is appealing to key players to focus solely on improving the sector for the benefit of Nigerians and not for individual profit. When the news at 10 returns, Residents of the Bahamas seek refuge on rooftops to escape flood waters as Hurricane Dorian continues to hover over the islands. That's an international scene with Around the World in Five. Do join us again.